Talia and the Wind Merchant It was summer again, just like every year. School was finished and all Talia's friends had gone to their respective holiday haunts in America, in Spain, in Cornwall. This year, instead of going to the south of France or to their country house in the English countryside, Talia and her mother went to the seaside. Talia had already been to many exotic beaches in her life, Saint-Tropez, the Barbados, Bermuda, but she had never been to the Italian Riviera. Although no longer a little girl, she was already ten years old after all, Talia was still too young to remember when the Italian Riviera represented the most glamorous holiday destination of all for Hollywood's jet set, who would flock to Italy like starlings, their heads full of Cary Grant, Audrey Hepburn and Roman Holiday. To an Italian eye, it was a familiar scene in every respect. Orderly rows of ombrellones stretched to both horizons, three deep along the sandy beach, each flanked by a long deck chair, each umbrella watched over by a formidable matriarch as attentive and attractive as a sea lion. Clusters of lithe and disorderly children of different ages scampered up and down the beach, plunging into the warm water and returning glistening with salt and wet with big white-toothed smiles. The teenaged females of the clan reclined on the deck chairs, every angle carefully adjusted, tending their tans, turning over at regular intervals to ensure every square centimetre was baked a uniform golden brown. Occasionally, one would get up for a quick frolicking dip in the sea or a self-conscious stroll down the beach to tease the equally browned and gangly teenaged boys. Along the beach, dark-skinned and dark-haired North Africans pulled huge carts along the wet sand. Enormous caravansarai laden with heavy bales of coloured beach towels, cords of furl design umbrellas made in China, multicoloured beach balls and fluorescent plastic beach tennis rackets. She didn't really notice him at first. A faint spot hovering in the heat shimmer at the far end of the beach... At first, all she could see were hundreds of kites. Small Japanese fighting kites, long-tailed, swallow-winged silk kites, large, sinister kites like black bats, modern kites like tiny hang gliders, all weaving and darting in the sky as if they were about to scatter like a school of small fish. His form became clearer as he got closer, slowly materialising from flickering waves of heat above the baking sands. He was a large, big-boned African, his already black skin burnt even darker by the hot summer sun. Whilst the Italian skin seemed to glow with a colour of elderflower honey or dark treacle, the African skin shone with a deep ebony luster, like a polished wooden instrument. He was wearing a kind of rainbow-coloured robe that covered most of his large body, but his feet, large-toed and sandal-less, made deep tracks in the wet sand as he walked. On his head, he wore hundreds of coloured sequin-covered hats, as many as there were kites overhead, balanced precariously one on top of the other, forming a wobbly column that oddly seemed to stay on his head. In his left hand, he held a gnarled wooden staff, the same colour and texture as his skin, and in his massive right hand, he held the strings to the hundreds of kites that hovered above his head. Wind for sale, he called out. Who would buy the wind? And he chanted in a soft sing-song as he walked along down the beach at the water's edge. Who would like a fetch a wind? Who would buy a breeze? They're all for sale to fill your sail, to use them as you please. Hot Sirocco, Soft Simum, Northern Kazri, Wild Mistral. Winds all play games, have special names. Western Zephyr, Soft Shamal. The warm Chinook you once mistook for a wanton winter gale. Squamish comes in Halmatan. Each one could tell its tale. You could have the wind for free, on a whim or on a dare. 
or you could buy the wind from me. Just ask me, and it's there. His voice was like the wind itself, sometimes shrill and keening, and sometimes lost in the sound of the waves crashing on the beach. The other children seemed not to notice him and rushed past, shouting, seeing who could sprint fastest or dive deepest into the waiting sea. But Talia just stood and listened, her eyes wide. It seemed that the wind merchant was singing just for her. Talia was very musical and a note out of tune could make her hair stand on end like the sound of chalk scraping across a blackboard. The black man's voice was like water flowing over stones or the wind through the trees at twilight. Excuse me, said Talia, as if waking from a dream. You mean you sell kites? The African smiled and his eyes grew wider and deeper, his face wrinkled with laughter. No, 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 not at all, he said. My kites are just a way to make the wind I am selling visible. Without the kites, you couldn't see the wind. It is like so many things in life. It is not enough something exists. We have to be able to see it. Only then can it be shared. Talia looked up and high above she could see the hundreds of separate kites streaming in the wind she looked down and saw that even though his hand was closed around strings, none of them were actually attached to a kite. And each one of the kites was floating free, unattached, as if obeying his command. You see, you can't see the wind, but it's always there, somewhere, resting or raging. But if you can't see it, you can't speak to it and it can't help you. I sell the wind to those who need its help. But why would I need the wind's help? asked Talia. I have everything I need, and what I don't have, I just have to ask. I don't need anyone's help, said Talia, just a little proudly. Everyone needs help some day, my young friend, said the African with a smile, and the wind can be a powerful ally. The wind can help you in many ways, but most of all, if the wind is yours, you can share it with others. But you have to decide, and quickly. Do you want a piece of the wind? To own something is a big responsibility, and your chances fly away in an instant if you're not quick. Look up! Already my kites are already straining to be free, and once they go, they may never come back. Talia looked up and saw that two small kites were darting left and right, first dipping under the others and then spiralling overhead. In an instant they were gone, lost in the darkening blue sky, for it was already nearly nightfall and what had seemed like merely seconds had in fact been hours and the sun had traced its long arc towards the western horizon all afternoon. Soon it would be night, and Talia knew that her mother would be looking for her. Above her head, straining her eyes, she could barely make out the forms of the long tail of kites. It seemed they were melting against the sky in front of her eyes. I'll take the red one, she said quickly. He took a red hat from his head and handed it to her. She looked at him, surprised. But this isn't a kite, she said, her mouth turning into a pout. She turned her back on him and stormed angrily away, throwing the hat on the sand. She turned back to shout something abusive at the African who took such advantage of young girls. But he had already disappeared, along with his trail of kites, leaving only a set of deep footprints in the sand, now slowly filling up with water as the waves rolled relentlessly onto the shore. She looked up and down the beach, but there was no trace of the wind merchant, only a few lost families slowly furling their big beach umbrellas and getting ready to go home for the day. The sun in turn slowly dipped below the horizon and the sky turned its back on the beach. The sea turned a deep sulky blue and held its breath 
waiting for the moon to rise. Talia picked up the hat. A little soggy and stained from having fallen on the tide line with the seaweed. And so it was that Talia slowly walked home at the end of the day, a little sad, holding a red hat in her hand. As she turned back, a movement at the corner of her eye caught her attention, far above her head. In the dark night sky was a single red kite darting and dancing above her like a small dog following its owner. That night, she went to bed, pulled the covers up to her chin and closed her eyes, thinking of the wind merchant, the red hat still propped on her head. Just before she fell asleep, she felt the soft caress of a gentle breeze, even though the window was closed. Outside, a single red kite kept watch as Talia slept. Mm -hmm.